Okay. Well, hopefully everyone's joined. Um, my name is Nathan Ballou. I'm a senior data scientist here at Saturn Cloud. Uh, and this webinar is going to be an introduction to the Julia programming language on Saturn Cloud. Um, so one quick note uh, before we get started, um, any questions that you have, um, put them in the QA channel. Um, I'm not gonna be monitoring chat during, um, during the webinar, but we, we do have a couple of Saturn Cloud employees who are looking at that, so it can help uh, with any small questions, but any questions you have for me, put them in the QA channel and I'll try to answer them at the end of uh, the presentation here. So just to get started, what is Julia and what is the Julia programming language? Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with Python, MATLAB, R, that, those sort of languages. And in a lot of ways, Julia is very similar, um, but their phrase is, it looks like Python, but runs like C. Um, and this is basically due to the way that it runs in the background. It looks a lot like a scripting language when you are um, writing it. However, it has a just-in-time compilation feature uh, that allows it to rival the performance of C code without that low-level programming. Um, it is an open source project, um, and it is a high-level programming language. It's found a lot of traction in the financial sector um, and with numerical computing, um, but it is a general programming language. So you can do things like dashboards, you can do things like APIs, um, all sorts of things like that. Um, it supports multiple dispatch, it's dynamically typed, um, and it's designed for parallel and distributed computing, so it has a lot of benefits uh, and things going for it. Um, just as a disclaimer before we get started, uh, I am not a Julia expert. I've used it off and on since 2012 when it came out. Um, so I can get you started with the, you know, the basics and sort of the intermediate, but any esoteric questions, um, we'll give you some resources at the end that you can go uh, check out. So the second part of this uh, topic is, you know, using Julia on Saturn Cloud. Um, and so what is Saturn Cloud? Um, well, Saturn Cloud is a scalable cloud data science platform. Um, it allows you to run Python, R, Julia, any language that you really want to um, in a cloud environment uh, on scalable hardware and software. Um, it's got built-in support for uh, Git repos, SSH, secret management, and a lot more. Um, and then you can go end to end, you can do your notebook all the way up to using jobs and deployments in the end. So we'll um, actually get into using Saturn Cloud um, about halfway through this webinar um, so that you can get a chance to actually use Julia on the platform. Um, but for right now, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you would go about um, starting a Julia kernel um, on Saturn Cloud. So the first way to do it would be to create a resource. So here we click on new Python server, which is a little misleading, but uh, click on new Python server, which is a Jupyter Lab notebook. Um, you'll then select the image uh, Saturn Julia, um, and you'll be able to start the kernel. Another method is to start a new resource from a template. Um, so you'll just go ahead and click on new resource from template. If you click here, you'll be presented with a whole bunch of different templates and a few of them down here at the bottom are all Julia related. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're just going to kind of skip all those steps and get right to a fully configured resource by going to this link. So uh, Mel's going to go ahead and post this in the chat, but I recommend you go to this link here, um, which is going to get you set up in uh, Saturn Cloud here. Now I'm already logged in. So if you click on this without a login, you're going to be presented with a screen to log in. Uh, you'll just click either uh, sign up with uh, Google or with GitHub, uh, put in your credentials, and you'll be presented with this screen. Um, so I'm just going to wait just a little second here uh, just so people can get by that step. And then you'll get to this create a resource page. So once you're here, um, and feel free to take your time to, you know, to do the login, um, you're going to hit create. And what you're going to find is that you're popped into a resource. Now, a resource in Saturn Cloud is similar to a computer. Um, it's got hardware. It's got software. Um, you can turn it on and off. Um, all sorts of things here. In this case, we're dealing with an eight core computer that has 64 gigabytes of RAM, a 10 gigabyte hard drive, um, and it is running that Saturn Cloud uh, Julia image. Um, and then it has some additional script um, packages that we've added to, uh, to Julia as well. Um, if you go ahead and hit start here, 
It'll just take a second, and then you'll see that it's starting to go to scheduling. It'll provision the hardware, pull the image, uh, set up the environment, and then execute the start script, which is installing those packages. This can take a couple of minutes here, just depending on how many people are trying to access it at the same time. Um, so take your time here. Um, but once we get all this set up, what you're going to do is you're going to click on Jupyter Lab, and you'll be setting in the environment. So I'm just going to wait a second while this is pulling the image. Um, then I'll get I'll click start, uh, and we'll be good to go. Uh, feel free to put any questions in the QA or any uh, any issues that you're having in the chat, uh, and we'll try to get to those. So once that's loading for me, I'm just going to go ahead and get back into our presentation. And we're going to go over sort of some of the basics of Julia. Now, um, let me go ahead and check on that. Yep, so it's executing the start strip. If you go to logs, you can see exactly what's happening here. You can see that it's starting to install some additional packages that we need for this particular, um, this particular example. Um, and once you get down here, you can see it's pre-compiling this project. Uh, that's one of the things that Julia does is it compiles any code that you're running. Um, so that runs faster in the end, but it does take a little bit of time to actually do the compilation step. And then once you get down to this server app um, logs here, um, you should be ready to go. So click on that Jupyter Lab link uh, whenever you get to that step and you'll be put into Jupyter Lab. Um, so you can see here, we've got this Jupyter logo started. And what you're going to do is you're going to click on this Julia 1.7.2 uh, notebook. And you'll be presented with a very familiar Jupyter Lab notebook. Um, and you can type whatever you want to in here. Um, number lock on, plus one, and hit shift enter. And it'll start, and you'll see we'll get an answer. So what are we going to do with that? We are going to learn the basics of Julia, um, starting from variables uh, and basic arithmetic, all the way up to dumping in the deep end and training a classifier model, um, a classifier model uh, using machine learning. So to get started, uh, here's some of my initial observations about, about Julia. It is very similar to MATLAB. Uh, I find it most similar to MATLAB, but it's also similar to Python and R. So if you're familiar with any of those languages, you should be able to jump right in with a few syntax changes and get, uh, get started pretty easily. Um, it follows typical scripting standards of other languages, so there's not a lot that you need to change uh, in terms of your approach in order to get into it. It also has a really nice integrated help. Um, so if you run into trouble, just try question mark and it'll enter help mode. And then you can try out any, you can get information about any of the functions you're using or, or whatever. Um, and then one last note is you'll see semicolons occasionally at the end of phrases. Julia automatically displays the output of the last line of code. So to suppress that, you put a semicolon at the end. Um, we won't do that for any of the basic examples, but you'll see that when we get to the more complicated, uh, complex examples. So first things first, basic mathematical operations. Um, so this allows you to just do basic math. Uh, you can see uh, four to the third, we get 64 here. Um, I recommend you try out all of these um, as we're going along um, or any combination of them that you, you wanna try out. Uh, this would be a little dry otherwise. Um, but um, if we can do division, we can see that it follows order of operations here. We have a modulo for instance, um, and we get a float coming out of there. And then you can also round numbers just like you would um, in most other languages. Uh, so here rounding 20.3, we get 20. So that's the basics of the mathematical operations. Um, we're just gonna jump right into variables here. So as sort of convention for Julia, um, variable names should be lowercase and only underscores only if you really need them uh, for it to, to make sense. Um, so typically keep just variable names as lowercase um, and um, it go from there. Um, comments can be either a single pound sign uh, if you want it inline or for multiple line uh, comments, you can see down here, we have a pound sign equals and then equals pound sign. Um, and as you can see here, one of the cool things about Julia is that you can set this variable to whatever type you want. So in the, 
in the beginning. Here we're setting it to an integer, you get out 100. Uh, you do x plus one, you get 101, still an integer, but then you can reset it to a string. Um, and in this case, then it'll output the value that you have as that string. Um, so you can change the type. Um, this can sort of get you into trouble sometimes, but it does keep it very flexible. So the next thing that we want to talk about is arrays and vectors. Um, the most important thing here, if you're transfer transferring from a different language, is that it's going to be one base index. So that means that the top left corner of a matrix, for instance, is one one, not, for instance, in Python, where it would be zero zero. Um, so as you can see here, if we have one one, we're getting out the top left value. Um, you can have here we have a vector. Um, so there's no semicolon in there. So it just shows it as one uh, vector here. This is a matrix, um, which has as a two by two in this case. Um, and then you can select a range of values using the, um, the colon here. Um, so this is values one to two. And as you can see, that comes out with 10 and 13. Um, now, this may be a little confusing, um, depending on which language you're coming from, but this is because uh, values are stored in a matrix in a column major format. So that means that they're stored with columns next to each other in the memory. Uh, so certain operations are faster, and if you're accessing them as a list here, um, then you're going to get them 10, 13, 12, 14. Um, but just keep that in mind um, if you're trying to do, uh, or if you're trying to access values. So hopefully you're still following along, trying these out uh, in the Julia kernel in Saturn Cloud. Um, we are now getting to random numbers. One of the cool things about Julia is that it has a whole bunch of built-in distributions for random numbers, which makes it really suited to doing certain numerical computing. Um, here are two of the basic ones. We have a uniform distribution. It's just rand uh, is the function, and you'll get out a single value. Um, if you do rand n, it's a normal distribution. Uh, and in this case, we're doing a six by two matrix. So you just do six, two. And then you can multiply those matrices. Um, so in this case, this would be a 20, uh, length 20 vector. Uh, and a two by 20 here, we multiply them together and we get a two uh, length vector coming out. Uh, and again, these are, this is a random uniform and this is a random normal. Um, I wanna talk a little bit here about strings. Um, this is something that uh, is pretty easy to use in Julia, but the one thing that you need to note is that strings and characters are different. So, Unlike, for instance, in Python, where you could go from a single quote to a double quote, um, kind of willy nilly whenever you want to, um, a double quote denotes a string in Julia and only a string, and a single quote denotes a character and only a character. So if you put single quotes around a string, you'll get an error. Um, and so you can see that here, if we have some string is equal to this string here, then you can see that we have the double quotes on the output showing that it is a string. But if we access one uh, value of it, so in this case, the, the second value, uh, we can see that it comes out as a character with the single quotes. Um, we're gonna access strings just like vectors. So you can go to the second value here. You can also go to the beginning value. So this is the first value, or you can go to the end value, which is the last the last value. You can also um, collect a subset of them. So this is values four through nine. Um, and so that'll give you values four through nine. Hopefully that all makes sense. And hopefully you're trying it out as we go. Um, when we are trying to concatenate strings, um, so put two strings together, we use the asterisk. So you sort of like multiplying them together. Um, and so you'll do your string asterisk exclamation point, for instance, and you'll get hello world exclamation point as a string. And then if you want to interpolate strings, so you want to put, for instance, a variable uh, inside a string phrase, use the dollar sign. And so the phrase is dollar sign variable here, and you can see the phrase is hello world. So go ahead and try that out with whatever strings you're using. Um, and uh, this is you know, very useful um, for quick making print statements. So the next thing that we're going to talk about, and I know we're going very fast here, but hopefully you're getting a, a basic sense of what, what's happening. Um, we're going to talk about for and while loops. So 
Uh, in contrast to something like Python, uh, where you're using indentation in order to show what is part of the for loop, uh, in this case, you're going to use an end statement um, to show the end of the loop. So for instance, this first one, uh, for i equals 1 through 10, print i, you can see that we have 1 through 10 outputted, and then we have that end statement at the end to show that this is one complete statement. So let's say that we had an array called my array that had the values uh, of the range 1 through 10, a character a, and then a vector that's 10, 8, and 9. What would you need to do to print out all these types? Um, so go ahead and think about that for a little bit. Um, we're going to be using a for loop here. Um, and the convention is going to be uh, for x in something will allow you to access each one of these individual um, these individual values. Um, the function for displaying the type is type of. Um, so if you want to, um, once you have that value, you can go ahead and hit do type of the value, um, and it'll tell you the type. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds here just to play with that a little bit, and then. We can see here, this is the or one uh, type of output that you can have. Um, so for x in my array, we have print line in this case. Um, the type of the x value is type of x. And we can see these parentheses in here because I wanted to put a period at the end, um, but you don't typically need those. And then the end statement at the end, make sure you include that. So to continue our control flow uh, topic here, um, if statements also end with an end statement. So for instance, here um, we have an if x is less than y, we say that it's less than. Um, else if is spelled out, uh, unlike in Python, for instance, where it'd be ELIF. Um, so if they're equal, the relation is equal to, and else the relation is greater than. And then we can, again, create this uh, interpolated string um, using the relation as a variable and that'll allow you to see what the relation is. So again, we're kind of getting to the point where you may not be able to follow along completely uh, and type all this out, um, but hopefully you are still, you know, kind of building upon it, um, upon the knowledge that we've been, we've been gaining here. Um, so this would be a function. Um, in this case, again, we're using the end statement to show the end of the function. Um, and you would just return a value like you would in a lot of languages. So you return, um, your string in this case. And you can see that if we have uh, the function of five and six, we get x is less than y, which is what we'd expect. Um, the, a couple of things to note here, um, we can do uh, functions that are defined like this, but we can also do single line functions. So we'll see the next slide for that. And that would be similar to this. So if we have f of x is equal to one, uh, that would be a single line function. Now, one of the coolest things about Julia is that you can do multiple dispatch. So this essentially means that you can write the same function with different types of inputs, and it'll just change the output for you uh, based around the type of the input. So in this case, we've got one function that has two different uh, methods associated with it. Uh, the first one is going to be if x is an integer, then uh, give out one. And the second one is if x is a float, um, put an output two. So in this case, you can see if we put f of 1, which would be an integer, you get out 1. And then f of 1.0, which shows that it's float, you get out 2. Um, so this is really useful if you are running some complex functions um, that depend on the type so that you, um, you, know, you can have various types, various outputs based upon the type that's in there. Um, this is really cool and one of the things that people really like about the Julia language. And then the next cool thing, and, and probably the last of this section, is going to be something called broadcasting. So for instance, if you have the cosine function um, and you give it a vector, um, it'll come out with an error because it doesn't know what to do with a vector as an input. However, if you put a dot in between the function name and the parentheses, it will apply the cosine vector to each one, or the cosine function to each piece of this vector, giving you a vector as an output. Um, so this can be really cool in terms of applying functions that were not necessarily made for being in uh, vectors or matrices um, and apply them to a vector or a matrix. 
So hopefully that was not too whirlwind um, and you got a sense of the basics of the Julia language. And so now we're gonna throw you right in the deep end and do some machine learning and training a classifier module. Uh, uh, model. Um, this is going to be um, using the Flux JL package, um, which is a machine learning package for Julia. Um, and we have the example in that um, if you go to the resource that you're in right now, there's actually the code is, um, is in there. And we'll go through that in a sec, in a few minutes. So the cool thing about Flux JL is it's written entirely in Julia. So unlike a lot of other uh, machine learning packages that you'll find in Julia, um, it's not just a uh, like a translation of, for instance, uh, TensorFlow, um, but uh, it's written entirely in Julia. So that means it integrates really well with other Julia libraries like data frames, CUDA, MLUtils, um, to name a few. Um, it has many of the same features that you're familiar with. Uh, if you're familiar with PyTorch or TensorFlow, so things like data loaders, layers, that sort of thing. Um, and it features all those high-level extractions, but it also has some low-level customization that is uh, useful. If you actually take a look at the source code, which I recommend you do, um, you can see that if you understand the math uh, behind the machine learning, you can basically understand uh, the code that's written in Julia uh, because it's basically a whole bunch of math primitives. So for more information, we're going to go over a couple of things here uh, that are useful in our particular uh, example, but please go to the documentation. Um, so fluxml.ai uh, slash flux.jl um, is going to be a really useful uh, resource for you to uh, find out more about this package. So we're just going to quickly go over some of the basics that you're going to need um, in order to, uh, to in order to get started. And the first one of those is a data loader. So this allows you to load data in batches uh, to the trading algorithm. Um, this happens to be an ML utils type um, that they've re-exported into the Flux package. Um, but what you can see here is that you just give it your data, you tell it the batch size, whether to shuffle or not, and then whether to give partial um, partial uh, amounts at the end if you don't divide evenly into the total data size uh, with your batch size. Uh, so very simple uh, here, um, but it allows you to load your data in batches, which is really cool. Uh, the next thing is going to be this high level abstraction of layers. Um, so this essentially allows you to chain together various neural network primitives uh, to turn it into a full network. So this is again going to be very similar, um, a very similar to um, what you would be expecting, for instance, PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, so you chain together layers um, and you can then put things in like a dense layer, which would be a fully connected layer, convolutional layers, um, or for instance, a max pool layer. And we're gonna experiment with all of those um, in the example. Um, there's uh, much more to the list than is, than is here, but these are the ones that we're gonna be using uh, right away. And then to get your training done, um, we're going to be using um, a training function um, that comes with Flux. Um, this allows you to do the sort of basic model training um, all in one function, um, which is really cool. Um, the little exclamation point that you see there uh, shows you that sort of by convention, um, it's a hint that this function modifies the inputs that are given to it. So in this case, it's going to be the model parameters uh, that are modified and the model. Um, and when you get the output, you'll have a modified input value. Um, you can see here that we have this concept of epics. Um, so it's going to run this particular training algorithm 20 times if we use this code. You'll put in the loss, the parameters of the model, whatever your data is, and then your optimizer. And that's all you need to, um, that's all you need to specify here. Um, however, if you want to train manually um, for a little bit more configura uh, configurability, um, we're going to use the update function. Um, this operates in sort of a similar way, but gives you a little bit more control. And this is going to be what the example actually looks like. Um, so for in this particular example, we have two for loops, a nested for loop here. So for each epic in the epics, um, so starting at one, going to the total number that we want to have, um, we have an X and Y value coming out of the data. Uh, this would probably be a data loader, or it could just be data. Um, 
the, just in the raw form, depending on you know exactly what you want to be doing here. And then all you're going to do is calculate a gradient for the loss function. Um, you give it the model parameters and it calculates the gradient. And then you can put that into the update, um, which will take the optimization function, those parameters, and then the gradient um, and allow you to, to update your model. So this is the one that we're going to use in our example. The next cool thing that you can do with the flux JL package is pushing um, directly to the GPU. Um, Julia is generally pretty good about using GPUs and using distributed computing. Um, so if you just use the CUDA package, they can be pushed to the GPU with very little changes. Um, in this case, uh, one way to do it is just use this pipe here. So if we want the X value to go to a GPU, we just do X pipe GPU is equal to X um, or X is equal to that. Um, we can also bring it back to the CPU um, using the same sort of uh, nomenclature here. Um, if you don't want to do it that way, uh, or you have a little bit uh, different uh, method of, um, of instantiating your variables, uh, you can just instantiate the, the X value as a CUDA array. So CU is a CUDA array in this case. So this would be random numbers that are in a CUDA array already. So this is already on the GPU. And then you would need to use this FMAP function to move the model uh, and the model parameters onto uh, into a CUDA um, into a CUDA function. Um, so a little bit different there. Um, we're going to be using these pipes uh, just because it's a little bit easier, um, but you can always do it this way. Um, whenever you start with CUDA, I recommend you uh, output CUDA.functional. Um, this will tell you if your, um, if your resource is able to use GPU or not. And then just to kind of wrap some things up here, the easiest way to save and load models is with uh, bson.jl. Um, you just call save, you give it the, the model name that you want to use, and then you just give it the model. This will save all the parameters, uh, your training progress, et cetera, uh, which is really useful. Uh, you can load using the same method uh, or using the load method in this case. So let's go ahead and jump right in and train and classify our model using FluxJL. Um, so we're just going to use the CIFAR 10 data set. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this data set. It consists of 60,000 32 by 32 color images. Uh, there are 10 classes here, airplane through truck. And um, there are 50,000 training images and 10,000 test images. And we're going to see how well we can get a model to perform um, on this set. So let's go ahead and train it. So I'm going to go back to my Jupyter lab here. And I'm going to click over on the left on Julia Machine Learning. And once it opens, I'm just going to go ahead and hit start because um, it does take a couple minutes to do the training. Um, and then we'll kind of go through this very briefly, just kind of touching on a couple of things that we've already talked about. Um, in this case, this um, um, this model is training on a CPU, um, but you could very easily change the resource uh, to a GPU, and I'll show you how you would go ahead and do that. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be giving our imports. Um, we haven't talked about this yet, but as you can see here, we're going to be using using um, or to go ahead and import a different package. Uh, so this is very similar if you want to use import in Python or library in R. Um, and you can see we use the colon to denote an individual um, part of that package. Um, we set some environmental variables and regular variables here. Um, as you can see, we're only doing two epics um, for this particular training run, just because we want to um, let me just get it started. Um, we want to uh, have it run a little bit more quickly, um, and um, but you could always increase that um, uh, to you know, let's say fifty uh, in order to get a little bit um, more accurate model. Um, you can see that we have this CUDA.functional that we were working with before. So this will allow you to decide, do you want it on a GPU or do you want it on a CPU trip based model? Um, to come up to the top here, just one thing to note is that the import statement took about 19 seconds. Now that may seem a little bit weird, uh, particularly if you're coming from Python, for instance, where that would be nearly instantaneous. Um, but what's happening here is Julia is pre-compiling the libraries. Um, so that it actually um, can use them more efficiently in the rest of the code. Um, so that's part of that compilation step. 
Um, so it's using that just-in-time compiler uh, in order to turn it into a little bit of a code, which will um, run more quickly in the future. Um, but uh, it does take a little bit of time, uh, a little bit of wall time just to get started. Um, so here, we're going to go ahead and download the data set, put it into a data letter. You can take a look at each one of these um, you know, on your own time to, to see exactly what's happening. And then we're just going to take it, uh, one of the values. We're going to take the first value. We can see it's a frog. Um, and it is identified correctly as a frog, um, which is good. Um, we can see here that we're creating a model. We're just chaining together a few layers here. We have two convolutional layers, a max pool. Um, we flatten the model and before we put it into our dense layers. Um, and it's a pretty basic model here. Obviously, you can use much more complex models if you want to. Um, I recommend uh, checking out the metalhead.jl library. Um, if you're looking for particularly vision models, they have a lot of the standards there um, already pre-built for you, so you don't have to uh, build them by hand. Um, so that's one uh, excellent resource there for you. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to move it onto the appropriate. We're going to move the model onto the appropriate device. In this case, it's a CPU, so it won't actually move anywhere. Um, we're going to go ahead and define the loss, the optimization. Uh, functions here. Um, so we're going to use logistic cross entropy um, for the loss function, and we're going to use the atom optimizer um, in order to um, actually optimize the, the gradients here. Um, and then the last thing that we do is we have to pull out the parameters of the model um, and we store those separately. Uh, you can see here we have the semicolon because I didn't want to print them all out. There's a couple thousand of them probably, um, but that's where you would go ahead and put in the parameters. Um, so this is going to take a few minutes to train. Um, I it, hopefully you've gotten it started before I have, so that you can actually see the output. Um, but you can see here, if we get down to the bottom, we're just going to test the overall accuracy um, and then test um, to see what each class, how well each class works, um, or how the model works on each class. So we'll get a percentage for each class, um, and then we'll just take a look at one of the final pictures and to see how the model gives on that picture. So I recommend you know waiting for this to all finish. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go back to the slides and we're going to talk about a few other resources that you can uh, take a look at when you are learning a little bit about, more about Julia. Um, but I recommend that you, you play around with this a little bit um, so that you can you know, understand what's happening. So uh, to bring it back to the slideshow, here are a few more resources that I recommend you you, uh, you take a look at. Now, all these slides will be emailed to you at the end so that you can you can take a look at them. Um, uh, but uh, just, just as an overall um, view here, you can look at the docs. Uh, Julia has a really nice discourse forum um, that is pretty active, um, that is a great, um, a great resource um, if you have any particular questions. They also have a Slack channel um, that you can find on their website. Um, I recommend going to their events page. Uh, they have a lot of webinars and that sort of thing um, posted there, um, which is a great resource. Um, and then there's this really nice Julia cheat sheet, which is, um, which is available that is a little outdated at this point, um, but gives you the basics that I went over. Um, so um, really nice resource there. Um, the other thing that uh, to take a look at is the Flux um, JL ecosystem. So these are the other packages that work really well with Flux. Um, and you'll see things like uh, Flux, Learn Flux Learners, which um, make it so that you can do things like cross-validation and uh, that sort of thing with your machine learning models, um, and also things like Metalhead or data frames, that sort of thing. So what are some next steps here? Well, the first thing that you should try out is the model with a GPU resource instead of a CPU resource. Um, that'll allow you to make significantly more epics and potentially a, um, a more complex model architecture. Um, so try out a different model architecture, try out the GPU resource, and I'll go into those as soon as I'm done with this slide about how you would go about doing that. Um, and then I recommend trying out the rest of Saturn Cloud. Uh, try a Python or an R template resource. Um, try starting those up um, and use a different language if you're more familiar with those. So if we go back to our example, um, we can see that we did have our outputs. So hopefully you've seen all of those. Uh, we got about 46% accuracy, which is not too bad considering um, naively we get about 10% accuracy. Um, and we only did two epics with a very basic uh, model, so pretty good there. Um, 
if you go back to the Saturn cloud um, and you go into the resource page, you can see here that again, we're using that CPU resource. Well, all you need to do to change it to a GPU resource is to click edit, change this to GPU, and then change the image to Saturn Julia GPU. Um, so you need to make sure that you have the correct image selected here and you have the correct um, GPU um, or you have it selected as a GPU image. And this will put you onto a T4 type resource um, and our T4 GPU resource that has four cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and you can go ahead and try out using this on a, on a GPU. The code should all work exactly the same way because we uh, had that um, little part about sending it to the correct device. Um, so you can go ahead and just restart the resource um, and get started on a GPU. It's as easy as that. So with that, um, we're pretty much done with the, uh, the overall presentation. Uh, a couple of things to note, um, you'll receive an email with the slides um, and uh, so that you can reference these um, any time that you want to. Uh, there will also be a survey at the end of the webinar uh, that would be great if you could fill out uh, just to give us a little bit more information about, you know, if we cover what you were expecting, if you want to get a little bit more information about something else, or if you have any other webinar topics that we're looking for uh, or that you would like to see. Um, our next presentation is going to be next week, actually, on the 22nd of June. Uh, Jacqueline Nolis, our Chief Product Officer, is going to be talking about styling our shiny apps, um, which should be a really cool presentation. I'm really looking forward to that because that's something that I've been uh, kind of not great at. <laughs> um, so hopefully we can learn a little, bit, a little bit more there together. <laughs>